Hey there, and welcome back to another video on first language acquisition. In this video, I want to talk about something very special, namely Dykes's. So to get us into the mood, let me ask you this. Uh, when I say, I like this one, how's that different from when I say, I like that one? The only difference is in the little words, this and that, and there obviously is some kind of meaning difference, but I would like you to pause this video and think for a minute, what exactly is that difference? How would you describe it? And how do you think children figure out that there is this kind of difference? Okay, so think about that for two minutes or so, make a few notes, and uh, I will continue now. So, um, in the last couple of videos, I talked about developing constructions, how children acquire syntax, how they build up their grammar, and how they go from very simple structures, hollow phrases that are just strings that are not analyzed internally, things like thank you or give me that, to things that are a bit more complex, pivot schemas like more x or let's y, and how they then move on to item-based construction, so the verb give together with different nominal structures, and ultimately abstract constructions like uh, subject, verb, object, word order in transitive constructions. We discovered that there are several processes at work that underlie this development towards increasingly complex syntax, namely your capacity to draw analogies, uh, your skill at distributional analysis, you hear different linguistic elements and how they co-occur with one another, uh, your mind's ability to memorize lots and lots of usage events so that they become cognitively entrenched in your mind, and also what we call uh, statistical preemption so that you keep track of competing constructions and the elements that appear in those constructions. Okay, so what we're talking about today, Dykes's, um, requires a kind of different underlying cognitive skill because we're looking at elements that are seemingly very simple. Okay, so we'll be looking at demonstratives, this and that, pronouns, he, she, it, you, me, and so on and so forth, and determiners, the, cat, a, cat, and so on and so forth. And you'll notice all of these are short, simple, apparently simple structures that uh, wouldn't seem to require the same kind of sophistication uh, that syntactically complex structures would require. So, how do children learn Dykes's? Um, <clears throat> what I'll have to say draws on chapter 6 of Mike Tomasello's Constructing a Language. Um, I'll talk about the first couple of pages in chapter 6. So the whole chapter is about nominal constructions and clausal constructions. I'll just talk about the first parts here where um, he talks about Dykes's. Okay, so let's go. Um, the most fundamental thing that I need to start out with is that um, there are two different kinds of linguistic units that we can contrast when we talk about Dykes's. There are symbolic elements which establish reference through meaning that they intrinsically have. Okay, So these would be just your regular kinds of words, a noun like chair, an adjective such as yellow, a verb such as give, yeah? normal words, you could call them, they are symbolic. They're symbolic form-meaning pairings, and the meaning corresponds to reference that you might find in the world. Dictic elements are different. Yeah? Um, Dictic elements are not symbolic in the same way that a noun such as chair is symbolic. So, dictic elements, their purpose is to direct attention. So, if they refer to something in the context, um, they direct the hearer's attention toward that referent, and they establish reference through context-dependent meaning. So, when we have a word such as you, or a demonstrative such as that, or an adverb such as there, <clears throat> uh, what we mean is not inherent in the 
word itself or its meaning. Rather, it acts as a pointer, not unlike a pointing gesture. Okay, so the meaning of you is different depending on the context that we find ourselves in. Yeah, same for that, same for there. And that, of course, makes these didactic elements difficult to figure out for children. Right, um, so as I said, personal pronouns like I and you or demonstrative such as this and that and spatial and temporal adverbs, so left and right, they're also dictics. Here and there are dictics. Now and then, yeah, temporal dictics. Uh, they mean different things depending on the speech situation. So for all of these elements, meaning is context dependent. The place and time of the utterance is important. The perspective of the speaker is important. So you probably figured out that this and that are different because this is closer to the speaker, that is further away from the speaker, or at least less important to the speaker. And shared knowledge is also a big factor in how didactics are interpreted. And of course, shared knowledge is not so trivial when you're three years old and you're just starting out to learn a language. Okay, um, here's a picture of uh, my son and myself. Um, and, uh, well, this, these, these pictures were taken a bunch of years ago, you can tell, yeah? And um, here's a paradox, here's a little puzzle that I want to share with you. Namely, um, at that point in time, my son didn't really talk, okay? That's normal. Kids that are eight months old, they don't walk around citing Shakespeare and doing stuff, yeah? So clearly he wasn't talking, at least not all the time. But he definitely knew how to direct my attention, okay? So you see him pointing um, very helpfully at a piece of bread that I'm supposed to put jam on so that he can eat it, yeah? So definitely kids at that age know how dyxis works in a way. So a dyctic gesture is no problem whatsoever, yeah? However, linguistic dyxis, the this and that and he and she, that turns out to be a surprisingly tough nut for kids. So why are dyctics so difficult to learn? Um, let's maybe look at symbolic elements first and at constructions, and then let's make our way towards dyctics and wha what might make them so difficult. So with words and pivot schemas, they're easy because they um, use linguistic sounds and map them onto things in the speech situation that are salient. Yeah? So we talked a lot about episodes of joint attention where you look at one thing together and there's a linguistic sound that you hear and it maps onto that thing. That's how you learn words. That's how you learn pivot schemas when you're a young child. Abstract constructions, similar story. Yeah? So you have a, an argument construction construction like we splashed the towel soaking wet, a resultative construction. And um, kids figure that out because they map relations between things in the speech situation onto the uh, linguistic unit that occur inside a syntactic pattern. And that's how they figure it out. Yeah? Now, with didactics, you can see how the situation is more complicated because elements such as left and right they refer to different things every time you hear them, okay? There's not one thing in the speech situation that objectively occurs and reoccurs. Rather, every situation is different, and you need to figure out that, okay, the thing that is constant is the speaker's perspective on things. So there are things to the left of the speaker, and there are things to the right of the speaker, and that, of course, is not easy to do. <clears throat> uh, you don't just have to take my word for it. Here's some data from children using the seemingly simple words here and there. I mean, what could be simpler than figuring out that here means close to me and there means further away from me, okay? It's second nature to us. Why should children have any problems with that? Well, here are some data. Um, I took them from a paper by Clark and Sengel. And, uh, well, <clears throat> you have frequencies 
of uh, kids using the words here and there for toys in an experimental situation that were either close to them or further away from them. And uh, sometimes the kids would use here, sometimes the kids would use there. And for us, it's perfectly obvious that well, here and there should map onto near and far. So we would expect more uses of here in the near condition and more uses of there in the far condition. <clears throat> um, and maybe some sort of progression as the kids get older. Okay. Now, if you want to just press pause on this video and have a close look at the frequencies. Um, but basically, you don't see anything here, okay? So here we have the two-year-olds. Here, even distribution across near and far. There, a similarly even distribution across near and far. So the two-year-olds definitely have no clue what's going on, which is kind of funny because, you know, um, you would expect them to have this figured out. Here we have the three-year-olds. <clears throat> okay. Five uh, here's for the near condition, only two for the far condition. That's great. Okay. Eleven for the far condition with there. Six for the... Okay. Okay. So this looks good. Okay. So maybe by three-year-old, uh, three years of age, kids have this figured out. Except then we get to the four-year-olds and... Oh, shoot. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Okay, this doesn't look good. No, this does not look good at all. Apparently here and there are difficult, even at four years old. So, so four years and eight months. Man, that's that's getting close to school age, yeah? And here and there are still problems. I see problems. Um, okay, anyway, um, let's talk about three different grammatical elements. Demonstratives first, uh, then we'll get to pronouns, and then I'll have something to say about determiners. Okay, demonstratives. Uh, words like this and that, you're all familiar with them. And uh, this and that, of course, basically encode spatial distance from the speaker and or the hearer. Yeah? So our perspective is sort of built into the meaning of these elements. That is something to wrap your mind around. There's a technical term, um, um, subjectification. Okay, you don't need to remember this, but if you see that term, this is what this refers to, that the speaker's perspective is part of the meaning that the linguistic element conveys. Okay, so if someone talks about this peak or that peak, it's of course different. It's, it's, it's difficult to say that, okay, one is closer to me and one is farther away from me. So um, you already see that there's more to it than just distance. It can also mean uh, where our attention is right now. Okay, so the thing that we're currently, well, the, the thing that is our current focus of joint attention, that is what we could talk about with this, and something that we haven't talked about just yet, or something that is more distant to our current topic of conversation. That could be that. Yeah. So these are natural extensions from the spatial this and that that is at the basis of this. Okay, so we see this and that with non-spatial ideas and entities all the time. So there, this and that refer to the centrality of an element within the set of ideas that we currently discuss, that form our current background of the shared communicative situation. So this is how you can say, this is what I mean, or that is what I mean. <clears throat> now let's look at children and how they uh, acquire this kind of logic. So here I'm coming back to the paper by Clark and Sengel and they had a very nifty experimental design where children interacted with two speakers, one sort of at the opposite end of the table and one speaker sitting beside the child. And these speakers would take turns and interact with the child 
and um, give the child prompts such as, you know, put this one there, or can you give me this one, or can you give me that one? And um, different toys were put on the table in relative positions to speaker one, the child, and speaker two. So let's look at a trial of this kind of experiment. So imagine that you're the child, okay? And uh, there's speaker one, experimenter one, speaker two. And uh, there are two cows, toy cows, on the table. And speaker one says, give me this one. What would you do? Okay, which one would you choose? Uh, this cow here or rather this cow? So my money is on um, this one here, yeah, because it's closer to the speaker and, well, it also happens to be closer to you as the child. Um, so yeah, probably you would pick that one. Um, now, what happens when speaker 2 says, give me that one? Again, think about this from your adult expert perspective. And I think what you would do in that kind of situation, you know, as the child, you would think, okay, we have two cows. One is close to speaker 2, one is farther away. So if they say, give me that one, that means it cannot be the one that's close to them. It has to be this one. Yeah, That's what you would do. Correct me if I'm wrong. Put it in the comments. Yeah, But I honestly think that this would be a strategy. Now, do children do that as well? <clears throat> Here's some data. And the somewhat disconcerting answer is that no, they not all the time anyway. Yeah. So here we have uh, three age groups. Yeah, kids, and uh, this is the speaker sitting beside them, speaker one, and this is the speaker sitting opposite them, <clears throat> and there are different conditions. Yeah, so I talked about uh, give me this one. So, if uh, the speaker beside them said give me this one, the kids pick the correct one. Yeah, the one next to the speaker and next to the child, in about 80% of all cases. So that's good news in a way. But um, yeah, <laughs> still, I mean, there's 20% trials that uh, where the kid did just something completely random. That's weird. Yeah? Um, and what is perhaps even weirder is... Um, <clears throat> so, if the speaker opposite the child said, give me this one. <clears throat> so, the youngest children uh, almost, well, in uh, three quarters of all cases, they gave them the wrong one. Okay. And then for the uh, second age groups, it's sort of 50-50. And only at four years um, do we get something like two-thirds correct. That is weird. You have to admit that. Okay. So children's this and that don't really come into play all that early either. Here and there, this and that. It's a tough business. It's not easy. Okay. Um, right. Um, there's more to say about the table, but I want to move on. So basically, the take-home point from uh, <clears throat> Clark and Sangle is that three-year-olds don't reliably use distant distance from the speaker as a criterion. The thing that is second nature to you and I, the kids don't do that. However, there is a beginning contrast that emerges, that is sort of a qualitative insight that came out of this study, that this is used more for the description of things that we currently handle or currently manipulate. So that's not so far away from uh, the notion that you and I are using when we talk about non-spatial this and non-spatial that. Um, that, on the other hand, with the children, is used more for things that you point to. And which are the things that you're likely to point to? Well, likely those are things that are a bit further away so that you cannot reach them directly. Okay. 
So children first learn this and that as synonymous forms that tend to be accompanied by pointing. And then between three and four years of age, they slowly begin to understand that perspective is the issue that divides the two. Okay. So what domain general cognitive process lies behind that? Um, it's one that I've mentioned earlier, namely role reversal. So if I am to understand the other person's perspective, I have to put myself in their shoes and imagine looking at the world from their perspective. That is not easy for a three-year-old, yeah? But as a four-year-old, you can begin to do that and you can try to see the world through someone else's eyes, yeah? And this and that actually requires you to do that. Okay, and with that, I'd like to move on to pronouns. <clears throat> so, you and me. Um, there is ample documentation for kids saying cute things like pick you up, okay, when they actually mean pick me up. Why do they say that? It's not because they're confused about who is who, um, even though I'm sure uh, you've heard about uh, children's difficulties of conceiving of themselves as personalities separate from their mother or primary caretaker. That's not an issue, okay? So once kids are talking this way, that problem has long been solved, yeah? Um, so kids of that age know how to say no, yeah? And how it can serve to direct the behavior of people who are clearly identified as other people. Okay, however, young people, young children don't yet realize that pronoun usage depends on perspective. So again, this role reversal thing is what um, feeds into correct pronoun usage. Um, the ability to take someone else's perspective, that is what correlates with correct pronoun usage. And unsurprisingly, perhaps, uh, kids with siblings sort of have a head start with that. So in uh, only children, you see that pronouns come in and correct pronoun usage uh, comes in a little later, yeah, all other things being equal, than with kids that interact a lot with peers. In child language corpora, we often find sentences such as Nomi found it, yeah, produced by Nomi herself. And this indicates that children refer to themselves with their proper names rather than with a pronoun, I. Yeah? This is normal. Yeah? If you and I were to do this, that would be cause for concern. But children do this as a matter of course, and that obviously differs from adult usage. So you and I use proper names only ever to introduce reference. And um, once we've introduced someone, we can use a pronoun, and that indicates givenness, yeah, that we consider a piece of information, shared knowledge, you know, that I know, that you know, and so on and so forth. Now, this monitoring of shared knowledge, of course, is something that we practiced for a long time. So we constantly try to assess what it is that the other person does and does not know. And if you're younger than four years, that is a demanding task. So before five, four to five years of age, uh, children have difficulties assessing the knowledge states of other people. And um, there's a study that I want to talk about for a little bit, Campbell Brooks and Tomasello, that investigates how sensitive children are to the knowledge states of others. Yeah? So specifically with a focus on pronoun usage, uh, we've seen other uh, experiments with regard to word learning that show children are very sensitive to the knowledge states and attention states of others. Can we also see something similar with regard to pronoun usage? So the experiment that Campbell and colleagues designed was such that the kids observed a transitive action. I'll talk about the so-called hitting game in just a second. And uh, the object that was hit uh, was referred to either with a pronoun or with a noun. So that was already one variable. And uh, in the test phase of the experiment, an experimenter asked the child what happened. 
Okay, can you tell me what just happened? Um, and then the <clears throat> dependent variable of the experimental design would be, does the child use a pronoun or does the child use a noun or does the child not use neither a, a pronoun nor a noun? Do they say something else? Okay, so there are different hypotheses that you can come up with uh, with regard to kids' pronoun uses. So, for example, it could be that a child only ever uses a pronoun if they've heard an adult use a pronoun. Okay, so they just copy that. That's a hypothesis. Um, another hypothesis would be that the child will use a noun if they know the noun, and otherwise, if they don't know what some weird thing is called, they will use a pronoun. That's very sensible. Yeah. Or the third option here would be, uh, if you like, the adult hypothesis. So if they behave like you and I, then the child will use a pronoun when the referent is known to the listener. Okay, When I know what it is that we're talking about, then I'm likely to use a pronoun. Okay, so let's talk about the hitting game. Um, it involves uh, two experimenters and a child, seen here. And experimenter one um, hits R2D2. Let's do this a couple of times. Okay, I think you got it. And uh, this is observed by the child and the experimenter. And uh, there are two conditions. In the pronoun condition, the experimenter would accompany the action with the description, I'm hitting it. Okay, so the child doesn't necessarily know what that thing is called, but uh, the child observes, okay, there's a pronoun, I'm hitting it, that is something that I can memorize, that's a proper description of what's going on. Um, the noun condition, the second condition, would be uh, the experimenter saying, I'm hitting the robot. Okay, so in that case, the child has uh, a noun signaled by the determiner, and uh, could memorize that. <clears throat> the test question for both conditions would be, what happened? Okay, can you describe to me what you just saw? That seems easy enough. Yeah? Um, there's a twist to the experiment. Namely, there's a second pair of conditions, um, which only differs in the absence of the experimenter. Okay, so in the first two conditions, the experimenter two was there with the child all the time. So they were watching the hitting game together. In the second set of conditions, the child watches the hitting alone. Yeah, and uh, again, there's a pronoun condition. The experimenter one says, I'm hitting it. And in the noun condition, I'm hitting the robot. And only after the action does the experimenter come in and ask the child, okay, what happened? Is there a difference in pronoun usage across the two conditions where the experimenter is present when the hitting happens or when the experimenter is absent? You can imagine that um, <clears throat> if the experimenter knows about the robot and how it's being hit and how that is a game, the child might be more likely to use the pronoun. I mean, at least that is what you and I would do in a situation where we talk about something that is known to both the interlocutor and ourselves. So, four conditions. Um, first condition would be the experimenter one uses a pronoun and experimenter two is present. Condition two, well, experimenter one uses a noun and experimenter two is present as well. And in conditions three and four, experimenter two is absent in condition three, pronoun usage, and in, experiment, in condition four, experimenter one uses a noun. In all four conditions, the test question is the same. Yeah, it's posed by experimenter two asking what happened. Okay, so if you like, take a piece of paper and um, think for yourself, what do you think um, will be, what, what do you think will come out? What is the child going to say? Are they going to use pronouns? Are they going to use nouns? In what ratios? Yeah. So, 
here's the results. So uh, we have the four conditions, uh, one, two, three, four. And we have responses by children um, in two age groups, two and a half year olds, 3.5 year olds. And what you see is the ratio of uh, different types of responses. So basically what we see here are responses in which children used nouns. Yeah? He's hitting the robot. How often did they say that? Well, um, in the first condition, the young children presented that type of response in 33% of all responses. 31% uh, of the responses when the uh, <clears throat> uh, experimenter used a noun, 28%, 36%, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's how you read the numbers. The numbers in brackets are standard deviations around that mean. Okay. So this kind of uh, block represents the answers, like he's hitting the robot. Here we have responses that are pronominal, where the child says he's hitting it. <clears throat> so let's just take one at random here. So the young children in the first condition, uh, when the experimenter was present and the other experimenter used a pronoun, I'm hitting it, in 46% of all cases, they're just repeating that and saying, He's hitting it. Right. Uh, and here we have so called null responses. So children would say something like, He's hitting, without using either a noun or a pronoun. Okay, now coming back to our hypotheses, uh, which one of these hypotheses fits the results in the best way? Yeah? Is there any hypothesis that really fits the data. Let's look at this. So uh, hypothesis one stated that if an adult uses a pronoun, then the child will use a pronoun too. That is something that we can test on the basis of these results. So pronouns are used in condition one and three. Okay. And if this hypothesis were true, then we would expect to see ratios close to a uh, hundred percent in those two conditions and much lower ratios in the other two. Now, okay, let's look at them. Uh, so condition one, we have 46% uh, he's hitting it with the younger children and 44% with the older children. So yeah, substantial ratio, but uh, if you look at the other conditions, it's not really a lot more, yeah? Um, so I don't think there's much evidence to suggest that pronoun usage in adults is just copied and mimicked by the children. That doesn't seem to be the explanation. Uh, so let's move on to the second hypothesis. The child will use a noun if they know a noun. Otherwise, they will use a pronoun. Sounds very reasonable. So let's look at the instances in which the experimenter said, I'm hitting the robot, okay? Condition two and condition four, where a noun was used. So, okay, um, with the younger children, yeah, uh, not much of a difference, yeah? When you compare that to the other um, percentages, the older children, they seem to have higher ratios of nouns, yeah? So for them, it might actually be true that, uh, okay, I've learned a noun, I'm gonna use that noun instead of a pronoun, which would be my, my default, and you can actually interpret the uh, lower ratio of nouns in the younger children in that way. You might say, yeah, it's because the younger children their memories aren't all that great yet, so they cannot memorize the noun that the experimenter was using. Somewhat questionable, yeah. So we talked about fast mapping and how children learn new nouns very quickly. Um, but hey, uh, it's a valid interpretation, I would say, of these data. 
Let's look at the third interpretation, which is really the uh, important one in this context. So you and I, we use a pronoun when the referent is known to both the speaker and the listener. And here, that would be true in cases where the experimenter watched the hitting, the hitting game, so where the experimenter was present. Okay, so do we find <clears throat> greater uh, pronoun usage in uh, the experimenter being present than in the experimenter being not present? Um, okay, so for the younger children, we have a difference between 0.46 and 0.43. Not really much of a difference there. Um, with regard to older children, well, 44% pronoun usage when the experimenter is present, 33, yeah, that could be something, okay? So this could be the beginning of children picking up on this perspective issue that we can use a pronoun when the other person uh, has this thing cognitively present, yeah, if it's given information. So that's definitely consistent with that idea. Right, uh, there's more to say about this, but I want to move on to our third topic for this video, determiners. Um, we talked about determiners earlier in a discussion of how children acquire them <clears throat> and how they start using them. So you and I know that when you hear a new noun used with the indefinite determiner, you can also use it with a definite one. Yeah? So when you hear the word rabbit for the first time with an indefinite determiner, a rabbit, then you, as an adult speaker, know that you can also say the rabbit if you talk about a rabbit that is well known to you and the hearer. For children, that's not quite the case. Okay, so uh, <coughs> Pine and Levin uh, conducted a corpus study where they followed children for several years, recorded them during uh, several intervals, and they found that uh, these children were using different nouns for their independent determiners and their definite determiners. So um, there's no or there's not that much overlap in early determiner uses and rather when children start to use determiners they use them in pivot schemas like there's the X or that's a Y or on the Z and uh, the data don't support the idea that children generalize across pivot schemas with the and the, which is what we are doing okay so there's the rabbit does not automatically lead to there's a rabbit that comes later and that's something that we'll look at right now so <clears throat> how do adults use determiners well Indefinite determiners, uh, un, uh, we use to introduce reference into shared knowledge. So you can talk about a cat, and after that you can refer to it as the cat. And um, the, the definite determiner then marks items of shared knowledge, much like pronouns. <clears throat> uh, indefinite determiners have actually several functions. They can indicate that something is not known to the hearer, but they can also designate non-specific entities. So if you have a huge plate of cookies, you can uh, ask your significant other, would you like a cookie? Yeah, Even though your partner has seen those cookies for a long time and they're looking very hungry. And uh, so even though cookies are shared knowledge, you can still say, would you like a cookie? Because you haven't decided which one to give away. Yeah. Okay, so that's the non-specific entity interpretation. Definite determiners, on the other hand, they designate specific entities. So when I say give me the small one, you can at least figure out which one I mean based on your perception of the different sizes. Okay, children are starting out using these determiners in pivot schemas, like where's the x, in the x, there's the x, and so on and so forth. And as I said early on, overlap is limited. 
So in the quantitative data that we have early on at age two, only 10% of nouns actually occur with both definite and indefinite determiners. And that means that children likely don't see a uh and the as a meaningful opposition, what I called earlier a paradigmatically related set. Right, so um, how do children get from their early pivot schema-based usage to adult usage in the end. There's a study that I want to briefly talk about by Marazzos. It's already a couple of years old, yeah, but um, it's still very useful. So the design was such that um, <clears throat> children were brought into the lab and the experimenter told them a story, okay? So in one condition, the story was about some boats and some cars. Okay, a non-specific set of boats and a non-specific set of cars. And uh, once the story was over, <clears throat> the uh, experimenter asked the child, okay, what's this? Okay, if you were in the position that the child was in, yeah, I told you a story about some boats and some cars. And then afterwards, I would ask you about this thing. What would you say? I'm willing to bet a significant amount of money that you would say, well, that is a boat. That is one of the boats that, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so you'd actually latch on to this non-specific interpretation that we can use with indefinite determiners. <clears throat> um, however, there was a second condition to the experiment where the story was just about one boat and one car. And uh, after that story, the um, <clears throat> experimenter asked the same control question, namely, what's this? Okay, so what responses did the children give? Um, in the first condition, the story about some boats and some cars, the children responded in the way that you and I would have responded with, oh, that's a boat, okay? In other words, they were using the non-specific interpretation of the indefinite determiner. <clears throat> um, however, in this other condition, yeah, let me tell you a story about a boat and a car. Here, you and I would respond to the question, what's this, with, oh, that's the boat that this story was about, duh. Um, children didn't quite respond in that way, okay? So there, the and a uh were used almost interchangeably. And that indicates that uh, while the kids had understood the uh, use of the indefinite determiner as picking out one element from a non-specific set, yeah, um, that is already in place, but the given a new distinction of a uh versus the that is not yet in place. Yeah, there's a reason for that, because understanding given a new requires you to understand the perspective and the knowledge state of the person that you're talking to. And as I said, when you're a three-year-old kid, that is not easy to do. Right, so how do kids' determiners develop? They start with use of definite and indefinite articles in pivot schemas, in a non-overlapping distribution. So there are some pivot schemas with a definite determiner which co-occur with a specific set of nouns that don't occur in the pivot schemas that have indefinite determiners. Um, from there on, three-year-old children uh, latch onto the distinction that the indefinite determiner can pick out a non-specific element from a set, okay? A cookie a piece of chocolate, a shoe, and so on and so forth. And only uh, when children are around four and a half years old do they understand that there's a second purpose to the distinction of the and a, uh, namely that there is the distinction of given and non-given, where the indefinite determiner uh, introduces an item into our shared discourse and the definite determiner refers to things that you and I already know about. Okay, 
that's what I wanted to say uh, about dikes, about deictic elements. Um, we'll continue this discussion in the next video, but we'll move on to clausal units rather than nominal units. Okay, so for the next time, please read Tomasello pages 181 to 194, completely online quiz, and um, have a good week. I'll see you next time. Bye.